Namaste Yoga Revealed podcast. This is Alec Vishal Rubin, and I am thrilled to bring to you one of my favorite human beings on the planet, Eddie Modestini. Eddie's passion for yoga is unparalleled with evidence by the fact that he's been teaching for as long as he's been a yogi, 39 years. His sharp eye for reading students' bodies through years of personal anatomical study is a keynote in his teachings, and that is what has him stand out from the crowd of yoga teachers. Eddie is truly a teacher's teacher. If you haven't heard the other episodes of Eddie on Yoga Revealed, please check them out, and I hope that you enjoy this episode of the Yoga Revealed podcast. Namaste Yoga Revealed podcast. This is Alec Michelle Rubin, and I'm so grateful to be here with you today. It is quite a journey from practicing every single day to arriving, right? The, the, the beauty of arriving here now. And just last week, whenever that was, I hopped in the car, drove north, and I'm so grateful to be here in Idaho with my teacher, Eddie, practicing, living life, and just connecting in, um, gosh, the, the journey of the lens of yoga in so many different ways. And if, as many of you know, over the last almost four years now, um, I've been diving deeper into yoga on the inside, this approach to yoga, which is different. It's uh, it, it, There's a depth, right? And Eddie has transformed my life. And I actually met Eddie in 2016 at a yoga festival in Boulder, Colorado. And next thing I knew, I was in India and we were doing more of these podcasts with Eddie. He's been on the podcast several times. You can check it out. If this is your first time hearing from Eddie, totally listen to this interview and also check out the past three interviews that he is on in Yoga Revealed. So Eddie, Thanks for welcoming me, welcoming me to Idaho, to your home, to share in practice and to share the joy of, um, of life and fly fishing. And it's an honor to be able to always share the, the long connection that seems has gone over lifetimes with you here today. Feels that way for me too. It's awesome. I love that. So we've, uh, we've, we've, we've talked about a lot of different things on yoga revealed before. And I know that we've dove into your student teacher relationships and, you know, where modern yoga is and where it's come from and the great teachers that you've studied from just to name two of them, Patabi Joyce and BKS Iyengar and some of the teachers that you've taught, like, Sean Korn, and I mean, you know, we, we, we don't even have to go down the list because you're a senior teacher here in this country, and I'm just curious for you, like, almost 40 years into your practice, like, into your practice, not even just teaching, but your practice, what's alive for you? What's alive for you in your yoga practice right now? Uh, pranayama is very much alive. I love pranayama. It's um, something that gives me so much to explore. Mm. Um, and meditation in asana. I mean, that's really a great way to describe yoga on the inside. You know, we really... In yoga on the inside, we set a pose. It's usually supported, but not always. And once the pose is set, then there's an opportunity to really drop in. And the mind doesn't have to continually review the setting, but the mind can actually go toward the core of your being and really look into what you're experiencing from the setting, not rehash the setting over and over again, which happens a lot when there's a lot of instruction given toward how to fulfill an asana, but it's to really feel 
what that asana, what that setting brings into your life and how you can work with it. Mm. And how does that, like, as you, as you share that, it makes sense to me. I've studied a lot with you over the last almost four years now. Maybe someone's kind of curious, like, what do you mean when you say set the pose? Like, what, what, what does that mean? And how do, how do you actually practically guide another student to go to depth without overwhelming them with directions of the pose, this or that? How do you set someone up who might be brand new to yoga in a pose to go to depth for themselves without them kind of being lost out on an island? Well, there's several different ways that we learn. Some of us are visual, some of us are very physical, and some of us are mental. So I try to share all those three things in the presentation of the pose. So basically I demonstrate it I, ta- I explain what I'm doing while I'm demonstrating. And if still a visual interpretation and a mental interpretation aren't available, then at that point I would adjust and give them a physical representation. Because, you know, if your strength is visual, that's your strength. It doesn't make it... A depth, it's not a de- detriment to your personality, your learning ability, if you're physical, if you're mental, if you're auditory. It it you know it doesn't it doesn't make a difference. Whatever mode you connect with most, that's the mode that is most effective at you learning the posture. Mm-hmm. So I demonstrate, I give an explanation of the pose. If those two don't work, I definitely adjust the student. But I feel it's important that once the fundamental structural alignments, and this is what I mean by setting, Mm -hmm. there's fundamental structural alignments of every pose. It's set up a certain way. You do that, once they're set, then there's a vibrational aspect of the pose that can penetrate your being. If you're sensitive, and if you're not sensitive, you develop sensitivity through the practice of yoga. Yoga definitely makes people more sensitive. Absolutely. There's two routes, two um, points of reflection that I want to go down with you. So I'm going to have to table this first one, which is based around Zoom calls and teaching on Zoom now from the three uh, ways that everyone learns, because obviously one's restricted. The right? physical. The physical, obviously. I can't adjust students. can't adjust students. So we're going to get there. I'm going to table that for a moment. Okay. Just for a moment. In this first route, yesterday in practice, so just to share, we'll bring this up a few times through this conversation and, and interview with Eddie. Eddie is teaching online for free by donation, but it's, it's for free. There's, there's no pressure Monday to Friday, eight 30 in the morning, mountain time, seven 30 Pacific. And it's awesome. And yesterday in class, you had said something, you know, once the, the fundamental structure is set in the pose for an individual, which might need to have the um, instruct the, the visual support from a teacher, who can see you because sometimes it's hard to see ourselves. It took me very long to be able to see my own body. Right. Me too. Right, You too. M- most of us, I would say. Right. And you said something that was so profound. I'd love for you to say it again and elaborate on it. How when we get in, in my, my paraphrasing, my representation to what you said was when we get into the pose, there is this ancient connection to all those who have stood here before us in the practice and we're in, for instance, a um, supported trikonasana, trying to pose, right? Um, and we're getting this download of information from the generations of yogis who have come into that pose in contemplated, reflected, and seen themselves through the lens of yoga by being in this posture. You know, there, there's a connection to those who have stood here before us. Do you remember saying something of that? And can you elaborate and expand it into your own words? 
Yeah, I basically said there's a thread. Mm. It's like a mala. Mm. It's continuous. It doesn't end. Mm. And there's a thread in yoga. If somebody is practicing yoga, whether it's now or 4,000 years ago, by getting into the posture and starting to look inside at what they're experiencing, they have realizations about themselves. And as we get into the postures and we start looking inside our internal landscape, the landscape of our being, which has a lot to do with our personality, with our individuated consciousness. You're an individual, I'm an individual. We have, there's a separation to some extent. As, as much as there is oneness, there's a separation between us. And I think in my unique way, and you do too, but the asana connects us. Mm. And through that thread of connection, we can come to very similar or same realizations that anybody has connected with that asana over the generations, which can be 40 generations of people that have been practicing this. Um, and some argue about the length of time yoga has been a practice skill or a practice method of spiritual expression. I don't know about the dates. I really don't know. I haven't studied enough to really do my due diligence with the dates, but I know it's ancient. And I know that I've realized things in postures because of my connection with the posture. I've been connected with other people who have practiced those postures and had those realizations before me. Mm. Basically, it said there's nothing really new in yoga. I, you know, like, oh, I've discovered a pose. And somebody comes up with a pose it's probably been practiced before. <laughs> it really has. It's like a cosmic, universal connection. Really. And, and there are poses that have come into my being that I haven't studied with a teacher, that have just come from my practice. But is that my pose? Should I name that pose Eddie pose? No, it's not Eddie my asana. pose. <laughs> no, no Eddie Asana. The, the thing is that it's, I discovered it through my openness of being and my sincerity with connecting to the practice. Yeah, I feel that. I feel, I feel your genuinity in how you practice and how you seek to show up in just as much as you set the pose for yourself to go to depth in having gone to depth, you had to go to detail first. And I see that show up in so many different aspects of your life from painting. You're an incredible painter to the food that you cook, to the fly fishing that you are so proficient at. Thank and you. Yeah. I mean, it's so cool. Cause you know, I, I see how you've allowed yoga to ripple out into every facet of your life it's really cool because like i a jeweler you're an I, amazing goldsmith right okay so all of those things that i do hobbies let's say sure i'm a hobbyist so i love fly fishing i love building fly rods i love um i love jewelry i love making jewelry and you know sharing that jewelry with people um i really love painting all of those are very meditative. And you, ha what happens with the breath in yoga, the way it propels you into the present moment is the same thing that happens when you're focusing on fly fishing, when you're focusing on building something, painting a painting, making a piece of jewelry, your mind can't be wandering. I'm not skilled enough. Sometimes we become practiced enough at a skill 
so that we can allow our mind to wander and think about our next meal or some plans we have or memories that we have. But when you're learning a skill, you can't let your mind wander. You have to be focused. It's like you can't breathe before or after. You can only breathe now. So this, all of these things have been brought into my life because of yoga. I don't think I would be a decent painter or I don't think I could be as close to the goldsmithing as I am if it wasn't for yoga. And it's the same with fly fishing. You can't let your mind wander. All right. And, and I think it's so cool because the connection that you just made from the thread that has been practiced before <laughs> in these asanas and the realizations that you've come to in doing the pose and being in the pose that in that realization is, is it's not actually you. Like it, it, it's it's been experienced before and it's just coming through to you. Like you're remembering it's so in alignment with this quote. And I'd love, I'm going to read it and I'd love for you to elaborate on it and to reflect through it. It's one of the earliest known definitions of yoga in the sixth chapter of the Katha Upanishad. It says the condition in which the senses are held still and one becomes undistracted is named yoga 6.11. Okay, so I think there's a little bit of a trap there. <laughs> could you read it again? I, I, I could read it again. It's, it's a difficult one. So the condition in which the senses are held still and one becomes undistracted is named yoga. So do I think the senses are held still? I don't. I don't know. That's that's pratyahara, and that's a totally different like absorption point. Oh well, here's here here's yoga. When you're fully absorbed, yeah, then the senses are held still. Mm. But it's the absorption that holds the senses. I see so many people in so many practices trying to hold their senses still, and they're distracted. Mm. They are distracted by the comings and goings of life. But when you're fully absorbed by what you're doing, whether it's dance, tai chi, fly fishing, any skill that you really put 100% of your focalization of consciousness into, your senses are held still because you're absorbed by the moment even if it's the breath, if you're just thinking about your breath and you follow your inhalation from the beginning all the way through to the end, most people that are unpracticed don't have the ability to look at their breath from the beginning to the end without a thought coming into their consciousness. Mm. So it's the it's the absorption, it's looking at a topic, looking at a subject, looking at a process, and fully giving yourself 100% to that process that holds the senses still. It's not separating the senses and, okay, it's like we have, it's said we have six senses, right? The sixth one is negotiable yeah. but i think there's even more than six i think there may be seven or maybe more because we have means of perception that many of us that are watching have experienced that we can't say oh i heard that from somebody mm. sometimes we just sense something's different we tune into it. And we don't really know where that comes from. We call it, sometimes we call it intuition. Mm. But what is intuition? It's not really connected to any of the senses. Mm. It's, it's our sixth sense. <laughs> it's our sixth sense, right? And there's probably more. Yeah. 
there are more. I've had realizations through my yoga practice where I felt so connected with what? I don't know. What am I connected with? Is it the posture? If it was the posture, I would probably have that experience every day if I'm allowed to quiet, if I'm allowed enough time to quiet myself and drop in. But it doesn't come every day. It just comes now and again. It's that special experience, the kind of sparkles that you leave that practice and say, wow, that was different. And you kind of want to do it again, but you don't really know how to get back there. So we keep practicing. So we keep practicing. That's wonderful. I think that it's a nice segue to bring back onto the table who we keep practicing. And, uh, you know, for you as a teacher, um, you're teaching on Zooms every day, Monday to Friday, and you're teaching weekend workshops on a monthly basis. It's really awesome from pranayama workshops to healthy backs workshops to hip workshops. It's awesome. I, I love it. I love seeing it um, create more momentum through yoga on the inside, this, this system that you dove into from changing systems from Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga. To Iyengar Yoga, Yoga first. Iyengar Yoga first to Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga to, to my, back to my, Maya Yoga Studio and then kind of surrendering Maya Yoga to, to Nikki and your, your your past partner and the mother of your children, an amazing Vinyasa Yoga teacher amazing. in this country, one of the best. And, you know, creating Yoga on the Inside, which I know is very deeply influenced through all the systems with different teachers like Manuso and Arun and you kind of diving into your own and, and taking bits and pieces. I love what you've done with yoga on the inside. It's like you are the, the, the architect for your own practice and you've been able to find out how to teach this to others. And now we're on Zoom and I'm curious for you, I would love for you to speak to what are the challenges from teaching to Zoom, because I, I guarantee there's a lot of teachers that are listening who are on Zoom. They're probably, and probably have felt at some point in time, the difference from teaching in person to a room of two people, 10 people, 20, 50, 100. I, I know there are people listening like that. So what are some of the, the challenges that you've seen on Zoom that you literally cannot physically address that you can address in the studio room and how have you been able to work with that and what are some of your pros that you love about teaching on zoom well let me talk about what i love teaching on zoom first i i really i it's been my experience that i'm witnessing students take more personal responsibility for their practice i'm not in their room <laughs> when I am in the room, sometimes students are like, oh, if I'm doing it wrong, he'll correct me. I think that is the attitude sometimes. But when you're home alone and you're just listening and maybe watching a demonstration of a posture, you're more responsible for assimilating that posture and performing that posture as accurately as you can, because there's nobody in there. I mean, I do correct the students on Zoom. I look at each individual box. There's 25 students on every page, and I scan the pages and look to see if people are accurately performing the pose. And then, I encourage them to drop inside and get in touch with themselves. Mm -hmm. So I learned how to teach from studying and then practicing. And I teach what I practice. I teach what makes sense in my body. I don't necessarily teach what my teacher taught me because mm -hmm. my teacher was teaching me what made sense for their body. And as a young teacher, the first five, 10, 15 years that I taught, I taught what my teacher taught me. That's my truth. Wow. 
And so now with like, I have 39 years, three months of practicing yoga. I don't know the hours and the days, but I might be able to figure it out. But I've been practicing 39 years and it's really exciting for me to, to, to watch that, to watch my practice and to watch it evolve and to see what my being gravitates toward. Because yoga has always been inspiring. It has never become boring. It's always been exciting because the ceiling is so high in yoga. There's no end. You can explore yoga for many lifetimes if, that's, if that continuity is really true which I can't attest to, but, you know, I do believe that I've been here before and that I will return. I do believe in that continuity. Um, And I believe I've practiced yoga before. Even though I came to this life and I started yoga very stiff and very restricted in my range of motion, the way I studied it, applied what I studied to my body, the way my body opened up, I really feel like I've done yoga many lifetimes. And when you came to yoga in pain, I think you said with two slip discs. Two slip discs. Two slip slip discs in your back. What was it that you were like, I'm not getting the surgery. I'm going to... I'm going to fix this myself. Well, I had my left kidney removed when I was 12. And when they used, they, they used this machine that had a crank on it to pull my ribs and my pelvis apart once they made the incision to get back to the kidney Whoa. and remove it safely. So that machine put a tremendous amount of pressure on my discs. And this is how... I feel that I hurt myself, Mm. that it was done in surgery. I had back pain from that surgery onward for many, many years. Probably I got this back surgery when I was 12 and the pain lasted until I was about 28, 29. And when I started yoga, The pain was more in the class, but less in my life. Mm. And it was that that communicated to me that this practice could heal my back. And I've been pain-free for close to 40 years. Well, close to 30 years. It took about 10 years to to erase the pain from my back completely. (laughs) And 10 years, you know, that's a lot. Most people say... I can't deal with this pain for 10 years and that's their choice. And they might choose another, another Avenue, Mm -hmm. but there can be restrictions in your life from choosing those other avenues. Once you're surgically corrected, there are side effects for all medications, all surgeries. And I didn't want that. I wanted freedom. And so I got a hint that this practice could help me and I gave it everything I had. That's how I healed myself from pain. And it's not like I, you know, sometimes I go skiing and I get hurt. You know, I've been hit on the slope three times in the last 10 years and I fell trying to keep up with my son once. And I've, I've done some damage to my body with things that I enjoy doing. Um, but yoga has never failed me. It's helped me heal every single injury that I've had so far. What do you feel like the highest blessing that yoga has brought into your life is? The highest blessing? Mm. Being able to help people. Mm. I started by helping myself. That was my whole intention. It was very self-centered. I wanted to really heal myself from the pain I was experiencing. And I had absolutely no intention to teach. 
And one day I got a phone call from the university and said, we heard you're a yoga teacher. And I said, that's not true. <laughs> I practice yoga, but I'm a baker. I go and make croissants every day. I get up at three o'clock in the morning and go to a bakery and I bake croissants every day. What, why are you asking me about yoga? Well, we have this class that's full of students and there's nobody to teach them. And at that moment, I got the idea to ask them how much they were paying. <laughs> so I said, how much are you paying? They said, $25 an hour. I said, where do I come? I would love the job because I was making $7 an hour getting up at three in the morning to bake croissants, which I love to do. But I was pulled into that class by the university. I which university? The University of Massachusetts in Amherst. I went out and bought a book called Runner's World Yoga Book by Jean Couch. And it's stretching for runners. And she was an Iyengar yoga teacher. And I used that book to teach that semester exclusively. And I taught out of that book. That's funny. And that's how I started teaching. Wow. And I never stopped. And it, like really the greatest blessing in my life is giving me a vehicle where I can help people alleviate some of the pain that's in their life. Because the first noble truth is that in life there is suffering. Yoga makes suffering less. There might be pain, but suffering has a lot to do with our resistance to pain. And if we can accept our pain, we will suffer less. If we can lean into our pain and really accept it, then we start to make friends with it. And once we start making friends with it, if we make minor adjustments we can find out where there's a little bit less pain. Mm. If you run from it initially, it's going to chase you. It'll, and it's going to stay in your body. Mm -hmm. But if you make these minor adjustments, minor adjustments, and you sense, oh, well, that feels a little bit better. That is the process of chasing your pain. And you have to make friends with your pain in order to be able to chase it. Some teachers of yoga recommend the moment there's any pain in the body to move away from that position. That is not me. I mean, that's why a lot of my students are much more popular than me. Because students don't want pain. Hot, sharp pain, I disagree with. But dull, aching pain is something to look into and lean into so that you can get close enough to actually say, can you please leave my experience? I'm uncomfortable. But you have to get close to your pain in order to politely invite it to leave or else there's an argument there. And that's where resistance comes in. And that's where suffering starts. Pain plus resistance equals suffering. Mm. I love that the blessing in your life to bring that full circle is helping people. And I wonder for you, like based on what you've just shared from you know um, students perhaps not leaning into their pain on a mass collective level, modern level, right? especially in America, especially in America. And, you know, from what you just shared, how the greatest blessing to come into your life through yoga is helping people. Right. right? What would you offer to those who are listening, listening, who might be teachers, who might just be practitioners who want to be teachers where to me, like the, the, the common theme that I've 
seen in so many of the people and the yogis and the just humans that I work with and so connected with is that we all want to help people. That's really what I'm seeing more and more. Everyone, it's, it's sweet. It is sweet. We want to help people. And sometimes some methods might be stronger, soft upon how much an individual can help another. In regards of the lens of yoga, from the position of yoga teacher, what are like one to three golden nuggets that you would offer to someone on how said teacher can actually help one of their students? What do they need to pay attention to? What do they need to be cognizant of? Well, you know, I've been around a lot of yoga teachers and a lot of yoga teachers prepare for their yoga classes by studying the postures, by learning the fundamental structural alignments of the postures, possibly by trying to figure out a sequence and how that's going to land on students, possibly figuring out a playlist for their class. So what about the student? The student's not included in any of those three applications of preparation. Mm. I try to look and study my students. I try to watch carefully the way they walk into class. I try to listen and I ask students if they have anything they'd like to work on, if they have any pain, if anybody has any injuries. And that's when the class really starts to become effervescent. What do you mean by that? The, The energy, the energy of the students start to play a role in the way the class evolves. And it's through their needs. And it's, it's a hard way to teach. This is not easy to look at somebody move at somebody move into a pose and say, Oh, my God, they've actually missed this piece. Let me go and whisper to that person about that piece. Let me go help every individual as much as I can. And most of us as yoga teachers teach general classes. Mm -hmm. We're involved in the instructions. We're involved in the sequence. We're involved with the approach, with the energy that we're trying to create, the atmosphere that we're trying to help people experience. But I'm really interested in the individuals in my class. I'm, I want to study how your body works, how your spine navigates through this pose. I want to look at the individual as closely as I can so that I could connect with that individual and make their yoga personal. Because there's many directions for every single Pose. Trikonasana has a set of directions. Parsvakanasana has a set of directions. And we can know those directions really well and still not get personal with the individuals in our class. I really love how what you've shared, you've also spoken to in just a few words, and that you don't just teach yoga, you teach people. I teach people. That's what, that's my, that's what inspires me. I, you know, I, I do teach people yoga, but the emphasis is more on teaching individuals than it is on teaching the yoga poses, right. even though I use the yoga poses to teach individuals. Mm -hmm. It's not, I'm not fulfilled by getting somebody to do a perfect triangle. But what is a perfect triangle? You know, it's very different from somebody that has this affliction than somebody that doesn't have that affliction. So can the person with the affliction do the perfect triangle? 
What if they come out of a wheelchair and they can't stand up? Do you have the ability to lay somebody down in triangle pose, put their feet on the wall and have them do triangle pose laying down? I have the flexibility in my mind because I've had great teachers. Right. My teachers have done this before me. Mm. I've watched them very carefully. I didn't invent that idea. Right. I, I, Mr. Iyengar brought that to the table. You know, the table. H.S. Arun brings that to the table. Yes. Manuso Manos brings that to the table. I follow the thread of my teachers. That's why I'm connected to the tradition that goes back to Krishnamacharya, right. that goes back to all the way. Mm -hmm. And what do you what do you have to share on perhaps those in our modern take, which is maybe a little more disconnected from that initial threat? And not necessarily that I want to say disconnected. I want to be mindful along that word because I, I, I don't think that's an appropriate word more so um, it's gone down a different tangent well there is a tangent but yoga has a life and they're connected with the thread just by doing similar poses right. even if they're all invented in america yes it's it doesn't matter that that is yoga. There yes. is a thread that reaches back, and there's also a thread that reaches forward. Right. I started my first practice at a very exercise-based approach at Core Power Yoga, and the room was hot, the music was sexy, and it was fun. And I personally went to depth because I, I felt that, that thread even in that space. And you're not alone. There are so many people so that have started with what's called exercise yoga. Totally. Whether the room's heated up or sure. not, whether there's Which music. I love. I, I love it. Yeah, there might be music, there might not be. I mean, it, it's like I've, I've been invited into many different yoga experiences with many different teacher, yes. people and walked in and rolled my eyes and say, okay, don't judge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> just experience and you know sometimes it's hard for me mm -hmm. not to judge because I've also had the experience of walking into those studios in India mm -hmm. where there was a, a tremendous reverence mm -hmm. and respect for the practice mm -hmm. which you don't feel quite as much as you do in India here in America mm -hmm. you know so I think it's a spiritual journey. Yeah. I think it's a, it's, and I think the connection, the thread of connection to the tradition carries with it tremendous substance and tremendous depth. Yeah. And, you know, as you speak on the, this, the, 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 the quality of reverence, because I think that there's a quality of reverence that you hold for yoga, for the journey itself as a, in serving yoga. Um, I want to transition into something that's quite sensitive and uh, may, maybe controversial. You're going to put me on the spot. We're going on the spot, Eddie, because <laughs> um, it's something that you and I share <laughs> you're an attractive man and a beautiful human being and as am i what is it to be a male yoga teacher in these times and well, how do you relate to that and maybe would you have some words you know you you've got you've got time on, on this planet on me for sure right and so many of those who are listening as well i imagine what wisdom would you have to share for the fellow male yoga teachers who seek to serve through integrity? Well, it, it's not a good environment to adjust students in. And that's really kind of sad because mm. those people that are physically oriented in their educational modality, they, they're not going to get it through description of words and they're not going to get it through watching a demonstration they need to be touched what i do personally is i work with a lot of women that have the ability to adjust 
and I have women adjust women. Like your yoga teachers that are in the room teaching with you. Yes. yes who are on that level of teaching with you. Yes. yes. Just to add clarity. I'm sorry if I'm not being clear, but I mostly adjust the men in the room. And still, it's a vulnerable situation. You know, it's vulnerable for a woman to adjust a woman and for a man to adjust a man. It's We're in a time where there has been so much sexual abuse that many people can get triggered in a yoga class. And it's not necessarily what's happening in the yoga class, but the trigger that that reaches back into those individuals past where they've experienced trauma, whether it's verbal trauma, mental trauma, physical trauma. And if it's been of a sexual nature, they're vulnerable. And being able to work with that is very delicate. I would advise, this is a question you asked me. I would advise male yoga teachers to adjust less, to be very careful of the sensitive parts of the body, to put a sticky mat or a block between your hand and the student, because you can give action of the skin without actually touching them. Right, I saw Manusa do that to a woman in Trikonasana. He grabbed the foam block and he pulled it along her upper rib cage to rotate the side body to the skin. And I witnessed that. Manuso will not touch students like he did. And when he, when he, when Manuso was adjusting students of mine that I brought into the class, he would say, Hey, fast Eddie, get over here. <laughs> I'm like, Manuso, you're still calling me fast Eddie. <laughs> and he'd say, watch me adjust. And he would show mm -hmm. the adjustment just to keep the cleanliness there yeah. and not to be groping right. in a secret corner of the room. It's, it's, it's a vulnerable situation. And I would caution people in their adjustments. And it's kind of a shame because adjustments are really effective. They are. They're so effective. For at least a third of the population, and those they feel great. Those of us that are physical in our orientation, which I have in in my learning modality, I learn from being able to be put, especially in my early days in yoga when I had less sensitivity. On Zoom, what I do is I reach for the most accurate description as I can through closing my eyes and trying to touch into my personal practice mm. and remembering the things that I did and trying to apply that to the students that are on the Zoom. And still, sometimes it falls short. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. I appreciate the, the yeah, you know, I, I just think it's, it's something that is to be addressed, you know? It's, uh, it's an important reminder for those who are teaching in person where I do, know, I do know some people who are teaching in person during these times and they're spaced and then most people are online. So I think there's some great things from your almost 40 years of teaching experience and um, what you have to offer. And I'm just so grateful for the connection shared and the opportunity that I get to learn from you and to be a better student and hopes to be a great teacher as well. And um, I hope that a lot of people have pulled something from this interview. And I know this won't be our last for Yoga Revealed. And I'm, I'm curious for you, you know, what, uh, <laughs> what, what invitations might you have for the, the individual seeking yoga? What invitation might you have? What invitation? Mm. Research your teachers. Mm. Find out what their experience is. Mm. Find out how many years they've been practicing yoga. You remember I said in the beginning of my yoga practice, the first 15 years, 
That's quite a long time. That's quite a long time. And some people feel that they're adept at yoga after three and reach out to start teaching. And I would ask students to really research their teachers, see how many years they've experienced yoga in their own uh, practice, see who their teachers are, explore where they're teaching, how they're teaching, what method they're teaching, and you know, look at any reviews that might be available. Right now, Yoga Alliance is requesting for reviews of teachers. So you can read that in the Yoga Alliance website when you start to explore a teacher. Of course, you want to start with proximity. Who's the closest teacher to you? What's the easiest class for me to take? Because a lot of times we're choosing classes these days, not because of who's teaching them or what method they're teaching in them by how convenient is the class for me? Does it start a half hour after I get out of work or it's convenience, proximity, all of these things are factors in how we start to study yoga. One thing great about Zoom is that now I can get up at 4.30 in the morning and study with H.S. Arun. A senior teacher in India. That is fantastic. He's sharing his Zoom classes from Bangalore, India, and if I get up at the right time, his classes start at 5.30. Uh, I, I'm mountain time, 5.30 5 mountain time. 4.30 Pacific daytime. So I, I need to get up an hour before class in order to really present myself properly to my teacher. So I do that now. It's wonderful. Not every day, but from I time to time. I love that. Yeah. And uh, might you share verbally about your personal offerings and your classes and how I, people can find that? Okay. You can go to eddiemodestini.com. Uh, I offer a lot of information classes on YouTube, which is you could find through Yoga on the Inside. I teach yoga on the inside with a lovely woman named Kristen Bastiles, who is a phenomenal teacher. And we teach every morning at 7.30 Pacific daytime or 8.30 mountain time. It goes across the country um, as the time gets later. And we teach different classes every day. On Monday, we teach healthy backs. Tuesday, we teach a restorative class. Wednesday, we teach a hip opening class. Thursday is teacher's choice. We usually do supported back bends. And Friday is restorative again. So we teach two restorative classes, one healthy backs, one hips, one back bending class. Please come to Yoga on the Inside and join us. You'll be delighted. And when you come, make sure you say in the chat, you heard about it through Yoga Revealed. And uh, I am just so excited that we get to continually share an amazing ever unfolding relationship, Eddie. Um, I love you. Thank you. Follow Eddie on Instagram at Yoga on the Inside and Eddie Modestini Yoga. And myself, Alec Love Life Yoga, all the yoga. And I just, just opened Eddie Modestini Yoga, so... There's just a few poses on there. I'm sorry. There's a lot more information on yoga on the inside. And can I just mention one more thing? Please. We're opening a yoga on the inside membership based platform online very soon. And it's going to have, I've already filmed 200 videos of individual postures, all of which are supported, which will be sequenced for different topics and which, where you can study individual poses on how to get in and out of them at your leisure. 
So yoga on the inside is what we're really trying to get behind because it's meditation, it's asana, and it's soothing and comforting to your being. If you're looking for a teacher and you're feeling some kind of spark and a connection to what's been shared here, I do invite you to reach out to Eddie on Instagram, subscribe to the YouTube and hey, consider this membership that we'll be launching in the coming weeks to months. And uh, you might have yourself a brand new teacher that will help give you the tools to serve yourself, get yourself out of back pain, tune into the own afflictions that life will bring us that, you know, we'll hit the ground, we'll fall. And these tools of yoga teach us how to get back up more gracefully each and every time more and, and move forward in life in a, in a big way and to teach us how to stand on the, the Tadasana, on our own mountain. It's, it's, that's just, at least that's my experience. And I want that for you. We want that for you. And uh, from our hearts here, yoga on the inside, love life. Namaste. Namaste. Yoga Revealed. I hope you got as many gemstones as I did from this conversation. This is Alec Michelle Rubin. And if you are curious on how to find Eddie and practice with him, go to yogaontheinside.com. As for information on Eddie's free classes, Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. Mountain Time. It's free. Check it out on his website and sign up. Also, be sure to follow Eddie Modestini Yoga on Instagram and Yoga on the Inside. And in my life, when I devoted myself to the practice of yoga, I have watched yoga turn every page in my life in order for me to propel forward with greater points of expansion. And this podcast has been a massive catalyst for some of the most incredible people, opportunities, and learning lessons to come into my life, including Eddie. And I'm so grateful to share this with you. Eddie Modestini is the man who brought Purium into my life. Purium and other companies that Yoga Revealed stands behind is what supports us to continue to bring you next level conversations around yoga. And if you are seeking to get into the conscious entrepreneurial space yourself or to take your own health to the next level by removing glyphosate from your lower microbiome gut, the ultimate lifestyle transformation cleanse with Purium is an amazing way to begin. Follow the link in the description and you can save 25% off your order. And if you want to learn how to build an online business using superfoods, send me a personal message on Instagram and I would be honored to navigate this space with you. My friends, we are all in this together. Take care of each other and love yourself a little to a lot more. Until next time, this is Alec Vishal Rubin, plugging out to plug in. Namaste.